Hello again, everybody. I hope you're enjoying your Christmas season. I hope, um, I mean, I really mean that. I hope you're enjoying your Christmas season, despite the Omicron variant and all the news that uh, continues to swirl around. We need to keep our focus on our savior and uh, and not miss out on the joy that this season has for us, which is why I've been doing this series, if you've been following along with us, uh, on these different gifts from five wise men. We're on wise man number four, and our fifth one will be next week. Uh, and the first four are all from not well-known prophets from the Old Testament, but their message is timeless and it's incredible. And today, uh, the gift of peace from an Old Testament prophet by the name of Micah. Micah's name means who is like the Lord. And um, he has uh, got a, both a hard-hitting message at times in his book and also a sweet compassion about him. He says it like it is, kind of gives you the bad news, but he also gives you a silver lining, some good news. And that kind of falls in play in the passage we're looking at today. So if you haven't caught up with us for the last few weeks, you can go back to our website and catch those those um, other messages uh, or our Facebook page. You can catch those there and, and catch up. You don't need any of those messages to know what we're talking about today. Each of them are standalone messages. So I hope you'll just enjoy that. Anyway, we're going to talk about this guy, Micah, and let's see what his message is for us today. Let's begin with a word of prayer, then we'll dig right into God's word. Father, thank you so much for the word of God. Uh, it is life and breath to us. And we need it this Christmas season with all that's going on in our world and the discouragement. Every time we turn the news on, there's something happening that's going to try to, uh, you know, kick sand in our face and ruin our Christmas. But Lord, we're determined to trust in the Lord and look to him. And so, Father, we thank you for this message today. Way back in the pages of the Old Testament, several hundred years before the birth of Christ, and yet the birth of Christ being announced and the joy and the hope and yes, the peace that our Savior brings. We need some of that in our day to day. And I pray that we will glean something from that in our passage today that will help us to walk in peace for the remainder of this Christmas season. Bless our study today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's turn over there to the book of Micah, uh, one of the minor prophets. We're in chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. And uh, Micah was a southern prophet. He came from a place called Morasheth Gath. Uh, which was like a little community, kind of a rural community, about 30 kilometers southwest of Jerusalem. Uh, kind of a rural guy, spoke to the common man, but his message was to two main areas, Samaria, which was the capital of the northern kingdom, Israel, and Judah, the capital of the southern kingdom, so which was in Jerusalem. So he he was kind of an urban prophet. He was a country bumpkin type guy, but his message was as an urban prophet to these two main cities. And uh, it was a message of God's judgment on the nation because of their sin, their waywardness. But there's also a message of hope in his book. And you can't mistake that if you read through the book of Mike, it's just seven chapters, you would find that. So we're going to we're going to go right in the heart of it here in chapter five. And um, actually, chapter five, verse one uh, in the Hebrew Bible, Verse 1 is actually the last verse of chapter 4 because it kind of fits in what he was talking about there. But Micah, if you read through this book, you're going to find that he has a bit of a, uh, a way about him in his writing where he kind of gives you the bad news, but then he also, so you, you kind of feel like, oh my goodness, and then he comes with the good news, and the good news means so much more when you realize what you're being delivered from from the bad news. That's the gospel, by the way. The gospel is not God loves you and has a great plan for your life and that's all you hear. No, it's the gospel is you don't deserve heaven. You've sinned. You've fallen short of the glory of God and you got a one-way ticket to hell unless God intervenes. There's nothing we could do to save ourselves. We're depraved because of our sin. But God did intervene. Jesus came on the scene. He tabernacled or became flesh amongst us. That's the message of Christmas. He went all the way to the cross and died for us, that's Good Friday, and he rose again the third day, that's Resurrection Sunday. You know, it's a great message, uh, and the gospel is in this passage today. Let's pick it up there, Micah chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. 
Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. Hmm. Micah, he spoke in the latter third, basically, of the 8th century BC. So somewhere around 740 BC all the way to upper 690s BC uh, was his message. He had some contemporaries that were preaching at the same time. One was Isaiah. Actually, Isaiah lived in a community not far from where Micah lived. And if you were reading certain chapters in Isaiah and in Micah, you'd say, didn't, didn't Isaiah say that? Well, there's a lot of overlap there, and it may have been because of their friendship and their kinship. Also, their shared ministry to the southern kingdom of Judah. Um, also, Amos, who was a preacher and a prophet raised up to the northern kingdom, he also was a contemporary of Micah. So Micah's preaching at the same time. So Micah, although he lived in the southern um, kingdom, in the territory of Judah, uh, he, he preached about Judah and Israel. So I remember I told you Samaria, the capital of, of the northern kingdom of Israel, and Jerusalem, the capital of the southern kingdom of Judah. He preached to both of those groups. What was he preaching? What was his message? Who is like the Lord? That's what his name means. His message was that although there was economic prosperity going on in the nation at the time, they were doing really well, actually. But along with it came spiritual decadence. And one of the key things, one of the key attributes of that spiritual decadence was that the poor were being overlooked. You know, so the rich, the wealthy classes were doing really, really well, but they were coming at the expense of the common man. Micah is a prophet for the common man. And uh, he wanted to stand up and, and speak on their behalf. They were getting cheated by, in businesses by the wealthy. Uh, they're being marginalized. They're being overlooked. Uh, they were being basically put down in their poverty and the wealth, wealthy were rising up and uh, walking in unrighteousness. So there was this, this um, injustice between the people as far as of socioeconomic means. But then there was also Baal worship. Actually in Samaria, the, on the, some of the epitaphs there, a lot of the people had their added Baal to the end of their name, their surname, uh, which showed that they had an allegiance to Baal. Uh, that's how bad it was. So there was this Baal worship. So they had forsaken the Lord their God on the one hand spiritually. And then they were living it up in the economic prosperity, but at the expense of other poor people, like re disregarding enough. If you think, well, that kind of sounds like, isn't that kind of happening today? You're a Sharpie. Yeah, it is happening today. You know, here in the West, we have a lot of uh, economic affluence and, and, you know, it's just a well-to-do society that we live in, but not everyone is living that way. And these people were being overlooked. And, and as a matter of fact, the, the political and religious rulers at that time were putting pressure on the prophets to dummy up and not speak out against these injustices. There was some threat there. Micah cuts against the grain there and says, Oh no, I speak for God. Who is like the Lord? The Lord is going to take charge for these people. So he's going to speak the judgment to those who are in corruption, but he's also going to offer hope to those who cling to the Lord. So it's both and, and uh, that's what we find in our book today. Uh, so notice the first verse. Remember I told you it was the last verse of chapter 4 in the Hebrew Bible because it talks about a terrible thing. It says, Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. He has laid siege against us. They will strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Who is he talking about there? Let me give you an idea of who he might be talking about. Uh, 2 Kings, let me see here. 2 Kings 25 verse 7 will give us the clue to what we're looking for. Who is this ruler that's going to be smote on the cheek? By the way, that was a very insulting thing. That was a, That's a metaphor for that, that person was put down and very much insulted. Um, let's see who that is. 2 Kings 25 verse 7. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. Why, it's the last king in the Davidic line in Judah, Zedekiah. Uh, a guy that was not very righteous, sadly. And he's the last man standing. He barely was standing. There was all these sieges that was go they're going on by the Babylonian army before Jerusalem finally fell. And he's the last one standing. He's taken prisoner. They put out his eyes. At one point, he tried to sneak out the back way and they caught him. And his own sons were killed before him. And so he's the last one in the Davidic line. 
and he's he's taken captive and an end comes to him. So that's what Mike is saying there. He says, gather your troops, tr try to try to mount something against this siege that's coming, even though it's not going to work because they, they, that's the Babylonian army, will strike the judge of Israel, that's Zedekiah, with a rod on the cheek. Metaphorically for he's going to embarrass and disgrace God's people with a, an incredible judgment by invading your land and taking you captive and, and impoverishing you. God allowed that because that was the instrument of his just, justice and judgment because the people had sinned and fallen away from God. Sounds really dire, sounds really depressing, almost like you don't want to keep reading in Micah's book here. But Micah quickly comes to the rescue in verse 2 with this very pivotal verse, which is a prophetic verse, a messianic prophetic verse pointing to the first coming of Jesus Christ. Look what it says in verse 2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Ephrathah was kind of the ancient name for Bethlehem. And by the way, there was more than one Bethlehem. There was also, a, this, this Bethlehem is the one that's in the territory of Judah. It's just a little bit south of Jerusalem. There's another Bethlehem in the northern territory in Zebulun. So not to be confused with that, which is why they probably say, but you Bethlehem Ephrathah. So Ephrathah is kind of an ancient name. Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me, the one to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. He gives an incredible picture of hope. The Davidic line was going to be wiped out. with Z This hasn't happened yet. This, so remember, he's writing in somewhere around 740 BC to the late 600s BC, but the Babylonian army didn't invade Israel and Judah there till 605 BC, so it's a ways off. There was also the Assyrian invasion in Israel. Remember, he was preaching to, to um, Samaria as well. That's the northern kingdom, but to the southern kingdom, it's the Babylonian invasion, which came about 100 years later, more than 100 years later. Nevertheless, it was coming. And so he says, however, you're going to be rescued. There's going to be someone that's going to come. So we think that the Davidic line is wiped out. Um, it's look, looking pretty dire. Um, and then this verse comes to our aid here. Now, I want to say a couple things about this verse. Um, it says here, Though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. Now, Bethlehem was the birthplace of King David. Remember him? He was the most favored king in Israel's history, really. And, and uh, this is before that split into the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom. But David ruled in Jerusalem and, and he was the favored king. And, and so there's an allusion here to that, the birthplace of David. First Samuel 17, 12 tells us that, that David was from the town of Bethlehem. So this ruler, look what it says. It's kind of odd wording. Yet out of you, out of Bethlehem, shall come forth to me. Who's doing the talking here? God the Father is doing the talking. He's saying this ruler is going to come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel. So he, this ruler existed way back in eternity because he actually says that, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. So this ruler who's going to appear has actually been in existence. You know, he, he's not, he's begotten, not made, Jesus is. So he actually existed before the worlds began, yet he hasn't appeared, as it were, on the human scene. That's the night in Bethlehem when Jesus was born. So the son has always been there. The child, baby Jesus, was born in Bethlehem. That's when he appeared. Getting ahead of myself. So he came from distant past, like eternity, yet his coming is still in the future. There's some, another verse that talks about the eternal nature of the Messiah of Jesus. And that's who we're talking about, of course is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the Messiah talked about here. Let's uh, take a peek there at uh, Psalm 89, verses 35 to 37. Psalm 89, 35 to 37. It talks about the eternal nature of God here. It says this, Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. So when you see David written like that, he's not talking about literally David himself, but, but although he did make a covenant with David, literally, but it means to David and his lineage, those who would be born in David's line in his, in, his, um, in his lineage. So it says here, once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever. 
and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky. He said the seed of David, not, not David himself, but one of David's descendants will endure forever. Well, nobody lives forever. We all have a death, right? If we're human. David's tomb is there to this day. I've seen David's tomb when I was in Israel in 1998. Um, but it says one of his lineage, one of his seed will live or endure forever. His throne will be like the sun before me, like the moon. It's, it's timeless. That's talking about Jesus of Nazareth, the ever living one who died, but he rose again and he ever lives to make intercession for us. And he's promised to come back. Incredible promise there. Um, so this birth of Jesus was was predicted over 700 years before it actually happened. But it, but it's supposed to be, the birth is supposed to be in an area where there's no survivors of David's family living. Zedekiah got wiped out. Remember we read that verse of 2 Kings? Uh, and so there's no priestly line there. There's no, no one of Davidic rule anywhere around. The dispersion that happened um, had scattered them all. So there's no one from David's line living in Bethlehem. How is this going to happen? How would, how would this ruler come out of Bethlehem? Glad you asked. Let's go ahead to the New Testament, to a, a passage you might be familiar with. I'm being facetious here. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. How is the ruler supposed to come out of Bethlehem when none of David's descendants are even there anymore? Have you heard these words before? And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. You're familiar with that passage, but did you pay careful attention to what it said there? None of David's descendants are in Bethlehem. How is this prophecy written 700 years before? How is it supposed to come true? God used a pagan, arrogant king Caesar Augustus to decide he's going to have a census and everyone has to be registered for the census and you have to go to your place of, of lineage, your birthplace of lineage to be registered. So Mary and Joseph were living in Nazareth, north of there, and now, oh, so inconvenient, they got to make this trip to Bethlehem. And it's in Bethlehem that the days were completed for her to have birth to this child, this special child. You. Luke chapter one talks with an angel visiting Mary and says how she's going to have this child. And he's going to be the son of the highest and, you know, and he will rule over his people. But Micah said it over 700 years earlier. God's word is incredible. Just when you and I think, well, that's just a bunch of dusty old stories don't mean anything. Oh, no, no, it fits together. God has a plan here. So God used a, an arrogant pagan ruler, Caesar Augustus, to play right into his hands to fulfill the words of prophecy. And so the Messiah was born. And he was, this Messiah was born as a baby in Bethlehem, but he actually, he actually existed from eternity. Let's look at a couple other verses just to prove that out. There's several I could turn to in the, in the New Testament. But let's take a look at a couple. How about um, John chapter 1, verse 3? talking about Jesus, it said, all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. All things were made through him. That's Jesus. The verse ahead of that said, he was in the beginning with God. Jesus was in the beginning with the Father. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1.27 says, let us Make man our own image, the, the, the plurality of the Godhead. So Jesus was there already in the beginning before the world was made. It says th that all things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. That makes Jesus the creator of the earth and the whole world. So when he arrived in Bethlehem, that's not the first time he showed up on the map. 
he's been in existence long before the world was made. Let me give you another verse there. Just later on in the same book of John, John chapter 8, verse 58, Jesus is duking it out with the Pharisees who do not accept Jesus, do not accept his, his position. They don't see him as the Messiah. They're arguing with him. They think they're the righteous ones. And um, they say this astonishing thing. G Jesus says in, in 8 verse 56 of John, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews said to him, You're not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. He used a word that talked about his divinity. The same phrase that God, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush and said, I am that I am, that's what Jesus said here. He's letting the Pharisees know, you're not dealing with any run-of-the-mill person here. I'm, I'm very God, I'm very God. Now, they didn't accept that. They th picked up stones to throw at him. They thought he was blaspheming. He said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day because he was looking ahead through faith, but I, I knew Abraham before he was born. <laughs> Wow, incredible. There's other verses we could look at. Colossians 1, 16. You can look at that one on your own as well, that all things are made by him through him. So let's go back to our text in Micah. So this ruler is going to come forth. So, so Micah is giving this incredible hope for us that things are going to get better. It's going to be terrible for a while. The, the Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom in 722 BC, the uh, Babylonian invasion of the southern kingdom starting in 605, then 597, then 587, sort of three waves of it. Uh, is going to wreak havoc to the southern kingdom. It's going to look really bad. I've been saying this all along in the series. It gets worse before it gets better, but it gets better. And so he, after he says this, this ruler is going to come forth. There, so He continues on verse 3. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. Now he said something similar in chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. He said, why do you cry aloud? Is there no king in your midst? Has your counselor perished? For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in birth pangs. For now you shall go forth in the city, etc., etc. He's talking about Jerusalem there in those verses. Now when he says in verse 3, Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. That's a reference to Bethlehem, the place of Christ's birth. Okay, some evangelical scholars have tried to say this was a reference to Mary, but that doesn't make sense, and and that's that's really a far-fetched thing. Um, it's not referring to Mary, um, you know, herself. By the way, both Mary and Joseph train tr uh, trace their lineage to David themselves, from uh, one from Nathan and one from Solomon, different sons of David. Uh, their lineage can be traced in Matthew chapter one and Luke chapter three. So that was why Mary and Joseph had to go back to Bethlehem for that census. And that's how this prophecy unfolded. So he says, then the remnant, once, once she was in labor has given birth, when Bethlehem is birthed, as literally as it were, Jesus comes on the scene. Then the remnant of his brethren, Jewish people, the hope of Israel was born that night, shall return to the children of Israel. Now, it didn't all happen that night, and it hasn't completely happened yet, but this is coming, and the wheels have, uh, have been set in motion since that time that Christ showed up on the earth. Let's continue reading. Verse 4, He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. You know, um, He's talking here, his brethren, refers to the Jewish people um, and says they will return. So he says here, uh, back to verse 3, it says, Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children. There's an immediate context and a one that points to the future. The immediate context is they'll return, meaning they'll come back from exile. Back from the Babylonian exile, which they did. That's recorded for us in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. So the Jewish people indeed did come back from exile. That was the immediate context. But the greater context is that the Jewish people will return to Messiah in faith. It's a spiritual return from exile. That hasn't happened yet. Yes, here and there we see pockets of people uh, in Judaism who have recognized Jesus Christ of Nazareth as Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. But not the fullness of the Jewish people has not come in. You can read that in your Bible in uh, Romans 9 through 11, those three chapters there. 
So this was pointing ahead. And there's going to be great authority to this, this king. He, he, for now, he shall be great to the ends of the earth. Have you, ever, have you ever been in a situation where you're just like, you're frazzled, you just don't know if you can hang on, and you need to have a message of peace, or you need to have some peace come into your life? You know, that describes our world today. Described it back then too, but it describes our world today. People are restless. They're needing some peace, some order in their life. Every time we turn on the news, there's something about the COVID uh, virus or some other thing, world wars or other things that are going on, economic troubles. And and, and it's like where it just gets our knickers in a knot and we're thinking, oh, I just want some peace in my life. The message of Christmas is a message of peace. And Micah has ushered that in with his prophecy over 700 years before the birth of Christ. I live in an older house. The house is well over 100 years old. And um, in early years that I've owned the house, every winter I got frozen pipes. Ugh. And one of these winters, one time I had, and I just was so, I was at the end of my rope. I was having a difficult time in ministry. I was going through some stuff. And then I wake up one morning and, oh, my pipes had frozen overnight. I thought, I just don't know if I can deal with this. And so I said to my wife, you know, we're going to, the pipes are frozen. I don't even have time to deal with this. I had stuff going on. I said, I, I, I got to get some stuff at work. I'll have to deal with this at home. We'll just have to, I don't call a neighbor or get some water. I don't know, but I got to deal with this before the end of the day because I don't want my pipes to burst. And another person, a friend of mine from another church, heard about it. He and another man came. When I got home from the office that day or whatever I was doing, there they were in my crawl space working on my pipes. And they got them thawed. And we had water running in. The pipes did not burst. And it's like, oh, my rescuer has come. This is kind of the feeling to a much greater extent. Our world is waiting for, I need something. I need a breakthrough. You might be sitting here this Christmas season saying, man, I just, I got so much on my plate. I'm so distressed about what's going on in the world. I can't even see my family over some of these things with the COVID thing, or, or other, I've got bills that are piling up, or I've got some health issues. I've got some appointments with the doctor. I know it's not going to be good news. Maybe you've got a number of things and you're saying, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can face this. The good news is Christ has come and he is, he is a call away in prayer. We don't have to wait for his return. He is coming. He said he's going to return again, but we don't have to wait for that to come to have the benefit of his help in our lives now. We can call on him and he can usher in the peace because he is the Prince of Peace. Look what it said there. After it said, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God, and they shall abide for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. And this one shall be peace. It's one of his names is peace. Ephesians 2 verse 14 says, he himself is our peace who broke down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. He himself, Jesus, is our peace, our shalom, our wholeness and our fullness. The word shalom means uh, wholeness, fullness, where nothing's broken and nothing's missing. He's what we need to fill every crack and, and cause all things to become new in our life. I want to read you a final verse here. Actually, let, let me just go back for just a second. Earlier in this book, in Micah chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, Micah said this, and by the way, Isaiah also said this, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow to it. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. This hasn't happened yet. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion the law shall go forth, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between many peoples and rebuke strong nations afar off. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. That's peace. Weapons turned into garden tools. That's peace. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. But everyone shall sit under his vine and under his fig tree. That's a metaphor for a peaceful existence. And no one shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts has spoken. For all people walk each in the name of his God, but we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. That's an incredible description of the wonderful fullness of great Christ's peace that will be ushered in at the end of time. That hasn't happened yet, but we have the presence of God in our lives now to hold on to 
as a down payment in a foretaste until the fullness of that piece comes in. Let's close our service today with a great promise. I bet you've heard this one before too. Isaiah chapter 9, Jesus ushers in peace. Micah said, this one will be our peace. Isaiah said essentially the same thing. Look what he said there. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. Have you heard these verses before? For unto you, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David, and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from this time forth, forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He said of the increase of his government and of his peace, there'll be no end. Why? Because he's the Prince of Peace. He embodies it. He ushers it in. His reign is a reign of peace. And you and I have that. It's going to come in fullness when Christ comes again. That hasn't happened yet, but he's coming soon. We don't know when he's coming, but we need to be ready when he is. We need to have our hearts right with him. But in the meantime, we can walk in peace if the Prince of Peace resides in our heart. Have you asked Christ, the Prince of Peace, to come into your heart and bring peace to your life? Why don't you do that with me right now as we pray and close today. Father, we thank you for this message from the prophet Micah, this wise man who brought his gift of the message of Christ's peace. And he's brought it to us today. He brought it to his people 700 years before the birth of Christ, but he brings it to our hearts today through the scriptures. Oh God, we need the peace of Christ ruling in our heart. We can't go by what we can accomplish on our own. That's not gonna cut it. We need the Christ of Christmas, the Prince of Peace. So we pray right now, Lord Jesus, oh, come into my life. Take hold of the reins over my life and be my Lord and my Savior. I confess my sins to you. Be my Savior. Bring peace into my heart and help me to live for you from now on. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Talk to me about that, friend. Send me an email. Uh, I'd be more than happy to send you some literature to talk about how you can continue your walk with Christ even closer and, and get to know this Savior who loves you so much. We'll see you next week. We've got a great conclusion to this series on wise men bring their gifts to us this Christmas season. We're going to hear from a wise man from the New Testament next week. You catch us then.